Welcome back. There are some seats towards the front for people who are standing at the back. Uh, well, we are in this session, we're going to try to analyse the key trends through the 1920s, 2020s, 100 years later, 2020s. We're going to do COVID, Brexit, key, key changes. We want to understand how they're going to affect things. We're, of course, going to have a discussion of net zero. Uh, we may, in the background, have as well some demographics, can't resist some demographics, and perhaps even some technology. We're going to start with a presentation. We're going to hear from Sophie Hale, her principal economist with here at the Resolution, and also we're going to hear from Anna Valero from the Centre for Economic Performance at our partners at the LSE, and we'll then hear from Linda and Nick. Sophie, up to you to set the ball rolling, please. Uh, okay, thank you, David. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, the second chapter, which is the decisive decade. Um, and so what is this all about? Um, so in the lead up to the financial crisis, we had this period of sort of relative economic stability um, for many years, um, co often called the Great Moderation. Um, and in the years since, we've really started to see um, this economic disruption um, that you can kind of see a bit in this chart. Um, and the 2020s is certainly going to be a decade of change. Um, so as David says, we have the kind of long-lasting changes um, that we've already been experiencing, so demographic change and technology change. But we now have these sort of three additional drivers of change um, this decade. So Brexit and the kind of long-term impacts from that, the COVID-19 global pandemic, um, and the acceleration of the transition to net zero. Um, and we're already seeing these impacts um, sort of affecting the economy um, in this deck at the start of this decade, um, and even a little before. So shortly after voting to leave the EU, we saw the sort of pound depreciation feeding into inflation and causing a kind of cost of living increase um, of around 870 pounds um, per household. Um, before we kind of even formally left the EU, and we saw increased economic uncertainty affecting investment. And then before we even finalised the kind of preparations to leave the EU, the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Um, and the pandemic brought with it some of the largest volatility and output that we've seen in generations. And now what we're seeing is the recovery is kind of bringing a similar massive volatility in prices that we've seen this year. Um, and you can see that in this chart here. So the start of this decade... Um, has brought with it kind of exceptional by recent standards, swings in, in GDP and inflation. Yeah. Right. Sorry, the clicker is not. Okay, here we go. Um, so, uh, but there is more change still to come. So um, in addition to that kind of volatile start to the decade that we've seen, so the long-term impacts of, of the kind of Brexit shocks and the COVID-19 pandemic um, are still gonna unfold um, throughout this decade. And that's gonna be alongside that acceleration of the net zero transition that we'll be seeing. Um, and we need to understand how these forces are gonna reshape the context for the, uh, um, for the context for which we're setting this kind of new economic strategy for the UK. But we can't just assume that these changes are going to look like the changes that we're used to and the changes that we've seen in the past. So, for example, the 70s and 80s in the UK, where we saw this kind of big industrial change driving um, really big job losses um, and highly, geographic, um, highly geographically concentrated kind of economic pain, um, it's not necessarily going to be a good guide for the kind of change that we're going to see this decade. Um, instead, what we need to do is look at each of these shocks in turn and kind of really evaluate what the impact is going to be. Um, and we'll talk through these um, in turn. So me and me and Anna will kind of take them in turn. Um, but while and what we'll find overall is that while they will bring significant disruption to some sectors and to the workers and firms within them, they're not going to create this kind of radical reset of the economy um, that some might kind of be expecting, and nor the kind of mass job losses um, that some have predicted. Um, instead, what is possible is that they will instead just kind of reinforce the risks of stagnation um, and therefore the importance of kind of addressing this um, with a kind of new approach for the economy. Uh, so the first shock that we'll talk about um, is Brexit. Um, so the UK kind of formally left the EU in 
um, at the beginning of 2021 and started trading with the EU on um, under the trade and cooperation agreement. Um, but the economic impacts kind of predated that. And we've already talked a little bit about how kind of inflation and, and the cost of living and um, in, in investment um, were affected sort of before the UK even formally left the EU. Um, but what wasn't affected before then was trade. Um, and what we did expect to see is the UK becoming less open. And we have seen that now since we've kind of left the EU. Um, but we haven't seen it in the way that we expected to. So what was quite widely expected was we would see um, quite a sharp decline in um, relative trade between the UK and EU, sort of relative to UK non-EU trade. Um, and while we saw that a little bit in imports um, immediately after we left the EU, we haven't really seen it for UK exports at all. So the UK share, um, the share of UK exports going to the EU has actually kind of increased compared to sort of pre-pandemic. Um, but before we celebrate this as a sort of success and assume that this means that our exports are kind of more resilient than we thought to these kind of trade barriers, we should note that we have seen this big decline in UK openness and competitiveness, but just in a more kind of generalized way. Um, Britain is the only large European country um, that has seen um, a decline in openness in 2021. So while the kind of global trade picture was recovering from the, um, from the global pandemic, um, and in addition, when we compare to sort of pre-pandemic, so look, compare 2019 to 2021, we see that trade as a share of GDP has fallen by eight percentage points for the UK. Um, and that's sort of four times um, the fall that we've seen in France, which is the country with the most similar um, sort of trading profile to the UK. Um, the UK has also lost a market share amongst three of its kind of biggest non-EU trading partners. Um, so the, the US, Canada, and Japan. Um, and it's important to note that this isn't just a kind of unfavorable change in sort of import demand caused by COVID-19. So, um, you know, the shift that we've seen towards kind of durable imports. Um, the UK has been less competitive, like across goods products, when you have a look in more detail. Um, but there's more change to come. Um, and we expect that what Brexit will mean is that some pretty big swings in output and um, some potentially pretty painful shocks for some sectors um, and for the workers in those sectors. Um, and we have a look in this chart. Fishing is, is kind of one example where we could see um, output declining um, by as much as 30% relative to um, if we'd stayed in the EU. Um, but we also see sectors that are kind of set to grow on the other side, um, again, relative to the baseline. So, for example, agriculture, um, in the absence of kind of other policy changes that are going on this decade, you would expect to see quite a kind of positive boost from, from Brexit. Um, almost all of our professional services, so the kind of strengths that we have, um, are set to lose out um, from the, these kind of above average barriers that are going to go in, uh, go on services sectors because of the deal that we have agreed with the EU. Um, and the manufacturing input is quite polarized. So that's the kind of uh, pink kind of bars that you can see in the chart. And they're both kind of on the the um, side where they're declining as well as growing. Um, and what this means is that the overall kind of net impact on the manufacturing industry will be quite small. Um, so despite these relatively large sort of individual sectoral shocks, um, the overall industrial structure is going to re remain pretty much unchanged. So professional services will shrink a little bit around uh, 0.3 percentage points of, of um, kind of its contribution to gross output. But the overall economy is going to look very much like it does now. So we're still going to be highly um, services dominated, highly professional services dominated, and our manufacturing sector will still contribute less to the economy than it does, say, for France's economy. And this means that we shouldn't be expecting this kind of Brexit-driven industrial change to be fixing, uh, you know, kind of the problems such as regional inequality in the UK. Um, what's more, as we've kind of discussed, um, some uh, the overall impact on manufacturing is expected to be quite small, but when we kind of look into that, we see that um, the shifts are kind of favoring less productive sectors, um, and that's going to kind of provide a further um, downward pressure on, on our wages. Um, so some had hoped that this kind of manufacturing revival through Brexit um, could help boost productivity. Um, and it's important to kind of flag that, first of all, um, you know, our services strengths is not the root of our kind of weakness in, in our productivity growth, and we kind of talk about that in the book. Um, but more importantly, the sectors that will gain within manufacturing tend to be those that are lower productivity. So if we look here, you can see um, one of the sectors, the biggest sector set to gain is kind of food manufacturing, which is um, quite low productivity in, in 2019, um, whereas the chemical sector and electronics 
um, are set to decline as a result of Brexit relative to the baseline, um, which are kind of much higher productivity manufacturing sectors. And in fact, when we look at the weighted average productivity of sectors that are growing, um, they, that is £37 per hour in 2019, productivity compared to um, £47 an hour for the sectors that are shrinking. Um, and as I said, this, as, along with the kind of falls in output that we're seeing as a result of um, the Brexit shock, are meaning that real wages are set to be 1.8% lower each year than they would have been in the absence of this shock. Um, and that's equivalent to around £470 per worker per year in the long run. Uh, and so to summarise um, the kind of Brexit uh, story, so it has brought about change and we have seen this kind of lower openness, lower competitiveness of UK exports, um, but this hasn't materialised in the way that we expected, so we haven't seen that relative decline in EU trade. Um, we've seen some really big sectoral adjustments, um, but it won't close the regional divides or reinvigorate manufacturing um, in the way that some have hoped. Um, and instead, the long-lasting impact is going to be weaker productivity and real wage growth. Uh, so I'm going to cover um, COVID-19 as well. Um, so we've also talk, shown in the kind of early charts the kind of massive volatility that this has created in terms of output and in terms of inflation. Um, and so what this means is that, you know, COVID is very much still with us. Um, but many of the shifts, um, the economic shifts have kind of faded at the same, you know, some of the, sorry, some of the long-term e economic impacts that we expected as a result of this will be smaller and more diffuse than we may have expected. Um, so we, this chart kind of shows one of those, it looks at um, retail sales, um, and we see kind of online sales, um, uh, of online retail sales kind of boosted, were boosted in the pandemic, so they rose from 20% pre-pandemic to around 38% um, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, but they have since fallen back, so they're now just around four percentage points higher than the pre-crisis trend. Um, and where this it has remained elevated, this is largely because of kind of um, elevated online food shopping um, rather than the kind of broader um, online retail. Um, and as I said, this means that, you know, some of the economic impacts that we expected from these kind of shifts that we saw during the pandemic may not be as kind of long-lasting long or transformative as we expected. Um, some have also seen silver linings in um, the kind of changing in working practices that took place during the pandemic. So hoping that um, remote working could provide answers to the UK's kind of productivity challenges um, and solve kind of regional disparities in the UK. Um, and we argue that this is unlikely to be the case. So working from home has persisted for higher earners, um, but the evidence suggests that what will be a much more material impact will be on well-being um, rather than on productivity um, in the long run from this kind of increase in, in home working. And in terms of regional inequalities, we also expect this to be quite limited. Um, this is because hybrid working is probably most likely to be the sort of dominant mo model for sort of professionals. Um, and while that allows for, you know, some longer commutes for workers, um, it's not going to allow a sort of mass migration of, um, of workers to sort of live in regions different from, from where their employers are. Um, if we look at this chart, what we see is that actually it shows that we really do have a lack of correlation between changes in, in kind of workplace mobility, so the amount of travel to, to workplace, um, and changes in where work is actually being done across regions. Um, the only kind of clear pattern that we do see when we look at the um, changes is in London. So in London, we're seeing um, a shift of workers from, from inner uh, London regions to outer London regions. Um, but even there, there's little sign that low earners are benefiting from these workers um, kind of spending, um, spending money locally as a result of this home working. So Haringey, for example, um, is amongst uh, the regions that has been most w worst affected um, by labour market. Uh, okay, so to summarise, um, COVID-19 has caused uh, huge changes to our economy and our lives, and we've kind of seen that in those, in those kind of really vol volatile economic swings, um, and we're still living through a kind of cost of living crisis that is at least partly related um, to the recovery from the pandemic. Um, but many of the economic shifts in consumption and work um, have unwound, as we've shown. Um, instead, the pandemic has provided new headwinds to output, um, with business investment remaining 9% below its pre-pandemic level, even as output has kind of largely recovered, um, and 430,000 fewer people being in work. 
And what's more, there are kind of longer term drags on productivity as well from COVID-19 um, as a result of the disruption that we've seen to education. Um, so which is particularly, and that has been particularly um, badly affecting uh, pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds. Great, so I'll pass over to Anna to talk about next. Thank you very much. Sophie, straight over to Anna Valera. Anna, thanks. Thank you, Sophie. So talking about the net zero transition, it's clear that thinking about this as a source of change is quite distinct from the shocks of Brexit and COVID that we've seen, which of course continue to have ramifications in the economy. This represents a gradual and necessary transition to a more sustainable and resilient economic model, both in the UK and internationally. A key feature of this is increased investment, innovation and change across the economy and its systems. And a lot of action is required this decade to keep on track to our, with our commitments. This investment and change is going to bring with it both opportunities and disruption for workers, the firms they work in, and for households. And these need to be understood. Talking first about workers, um, if we look at the labor market, the likely labor market impacts of net zero, we had some discussion in the previous session. Um, in our analysis, we argue that net zero is most likely to change jobs rather than destroy them. This change is going to mean adopting new technologies and processes or changing tasks within sectors, creating some new roles and changing the way certain jobs are done. There will, of course, be challenges for those working in what we classify as currently brown jobs. And th there are many different ways to make these classifications. The way we do it is we take the occupations that are particularly prevalent in the most emissions intense industries, where change is therefore particularly urgent. This chart here shows that set of jobs and they're colored in brown. Um, in general, these occupations haven't been growing too much um, in the past decade up to 2019, as you can see on the vertical axis there. Um, and also, they tend to be relatively lower wage, as you can see there on the horizontal axis. Um, but in general, quite few of them are likely to be completely phased out. Um, in fact, a key example, the biggest bubble you can see there is LGV drivers, large goods vehicles drivers. Um, we don't expect these jobs to disappear even as the vehicles they use become greener. So in total, the jobs that we identified in this way total about 4% of UK employment. There's also as yet no agreed upon definition of classifying green jobs and different methods are useful in different ways um, and different purposes. What we do here is again, we take an occupational approach and we identify green jobs as being those that already involve green tasks to a significant extent. We consider with our methodology, these account for about 13% of jobs in the UK in 2019. So far, we found that these jobs tend to be more highly paid. You can see they're kind of further along to the right there. Um, and they tend to be held by more highly educated workers versus their non-green counterparts, particularly also versus brown jobs. They've also been growing as a share of employment. And in more detailed analysis, we show that there appears to be a wage premium to such jobs, even after you control for other factors like education. Looking ahead, um, as was discussed earlier too, we know a lot of new green jobs will need to be created to enable the transition. So looking at the past might not be the best guide to the future. And it might be that many of those new jobs actually require technical skills that can be delivered by on the job training or by the further education system. Examples are offshore wind, where we'll need more engineers and, and te technicians there as well, heat pump insulation and energy efficiency. A smooth transition in labor markets is going to require the right skills policies to be in place support for transitioning workers that might find the transition particularly difficult, and making sure that the opportunities that arise are accessible to all workers. Talking about opportunities, we've done um, also a lot of work thinking about the opportunities for firms to innovate and grow in the net zero transition. And we find that there is evidence that this transition will bring economic opportunities for the UK. We take a hard-headed look at the UK's strengths and capabilities in clean technologies, goods and services, using a range of data sets. And we find that there is evidence of such opportunities. We're not yet a clean tech superpower, but there are strengths we can build on. So the bubbles in this chart represent different technology categories. Um, the bubbles in the top right quadrant are areas where we are specialized. It's like a measure of revealed comparative advantage in trade. We have a higher share of our patenting in these technologies versus the global share. Um, and where global patenting has been growing. So that's shown on the x-axis there. Clean technologies there are highlighted. That's in that top right-hand quadrant. Um, it's a mid-size category overall, um, as you can see globally. That's shown by the bubble size. Um, but we expect further growth here, clearly given enhanced commitments globally. So within clean technologies, there are some areas where we're particularly specialized, like offshore wind, carbon capture usage and storage, and tidal energy too, when we look at our patenting. And others where we're less specialized overall, for example, clean cars there as an aggregate category we're not specialized in. 
But we argue that if we invest now and build on the UK's innovative strengths, we are an innovative economy with excellence in our research system, we can generate opportunities to access these growing global markets and national markets, together with improved resource efficiency, of course, and resilience across the economy, and we see the urgency of that right now. However, um, important to bear in mind when we're thinking about our economic strategy, such opportunities are not going to be seized in the UK without concerted and coordinated efforts to do so. And this extends beyond environmental policies to growth policies, innovation policies, skills policies too. Moreover, new investments in innovation and other long-term assets can of course take time to generate returns. So even if we had all the right policies in place, this route alone would be unlikely to provide an immediate fix to our UK, the UK's productivity problems. Finally, looking at households. Households are going to feel the change due to net zero this decade, including in how we travel and how we heat our homes. So given the rapidly falling costs and rapid take up of electric vehicles, and of course we expect a new a kind of secondhand market to arise in the coming years, we consider that the key challenge for households is going to be in decarbonizing homes. This chart from the CCC shows the rapid acceleration of investment that's going to be required in residential buildings, and it's forecast to peak at 14 billion in 2028. Energy efficiency here poses a particular risk. We know that insulation installations have stalled since 2013, and the government's net zero strategy suggests we'll be upgrading a million homes per year by 2030. If we remain on track for this, the policy, the policy challenge is going to be to ensure that the costs are fairly borne. For example, 72% of low-income homeowners are living in poorly insulated homes, and addressing this is likely to cost almost as much as their average disposable income. So questions in terms of how these investments are going to be paid, how the costs and benefits of the transition can be managed fairly, need to be urgently addressed. And this is not only to achieve the transition, but to ensure that public support is maintained. So in summary, net zero brings opportunities as well as change for firms and workers. This decade, there's going to be significant investment um, and savings, which will follow later. So there are intertemporal issues here and there are trade-offs in terms of how we can enable that investment to happen. The concrete questions of how we're going to pay for this should receive much more attention. So bringing together kind of the session, um, the, the different sources of change we've been talking about, these three large but very different shocks and transitions mean we should expect more job churn in the 2020s than say in the 2010s, with both voluntary and involuntary job moves increasing. But the big picture actually shown here is that change has been slowing down rather than speeding up in the UK. So between 2011 and 2021, which is shown in kind of the last points there, um, which show decade change, um, the reallocation of labor between sexes, sectors was equivalent to 7% of total employment, compared to 20% experienced in the 1980s. As labor market change often happens through people entering and leaving the labor market, rather than through occupational or sectoral change, Demographic shifts this decade are also likely to play a role in driving economic change. So over the next decade, workforce exits and entrants are set to rise, and this might offer a temporary boost in terms of labor market mobility. So to kind of summarize on change in the 20s, the 2020s will be a decisive decade of change, and this is going to be brought about by Brexit, COVID-19, and the transition to net zero. These will bring significant disruption for some firms, workers, and consumers, but not the radical reset for our economy, perhaps, or large job losses many have predicted or it, when we're looking at our, our past, say, in the 1980s. So although the scale of change to the labor market will not be transformative, changes are likely to add headwinds to our already weak income growth, particularly in the short term. So rather than solving our stagnation challenges, these changes, particularly if we're not dealing with them properly, are likely to risk reinforcing our stagnation in the short term. So we kind of conclude that there aren't significant silver linings or silver bullets when we're thinking about these shocks and transitions this decade. Rather, these shocks and transitions represent the context within which our urgently needed new economic strategy must be framed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna and Sophie. And that, that chart towards the end showing the decline in job moves from one sector to another is one of the key pieces of evidence about why we're talking about a stagnation nation. Despite all this change going on, some of the economic fundamentals, it really seems to be a story of less change. Now we're now going to hear from two fantastic commentators. And by the way, if you do have 
questions and comments do go on to Slido and we will come to them in a moment. But first, let's hear from Linda Yu and thank you so much for joining us. Linda, your observations on what you've heard. Thank you, David. Um, uh, just first, a great job by both Sophie and Anna and, uh, and it is a terrific report. I do recommend um, taking um, a, a read of it. I'm not gonna give you specific page numbers. I know <laughs> Torsten's uh, looking for that, but really well done to the Resolution Foundation and to CEP. Um, and of course, Nuffield for supporting it. It is absolutely critical. Um, if you want to know how to solve uh, economic issues, you need to know, you need to be very clear about the causes. And I think that's where this interim report is very strong. It's like going to the doctor. If you don't know what's wrong with you, they can't really prescribe um, how to fix it. So I was going to spend my few moments drawing out a few points um, that um, hopefully can point us to some. I, I suppose some further thinking about uh, what, uh, what can be done uh, given the, 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 the various causes um, that have been uh, stressed. And of course, what we heard is that um, the three big trends of this decade are only going to reinforce the long-term issues um, of stagnation, which are driving stagnation. So I'm gonna start with um, inequality. I was fascinated by one of the surveys uh, that um, people are most concerned about. It's inequality, it's place, and then income and wealth. So I think this points to um, already some very interesting uh, potential strategies around that. So the report focuses on if you to address growth and inequality, um, if the UK were to raise and equalize incomes in line with five similar countries, that would boost incomes in the lowest quintile, the bottom 20% of the population, by over 40%, um, while the top, the top 20%, um, actually uh, are not worse off. They might even be slightly better off. So I'm not going to use the cake analogy because no one likes, everyone loves Bake Off, but no one likes cake analogies. <laughs> the pie, the pie growing larger, but redistributing the pie uh, seems to be um, achievable through essentially catch-up growth. So what do I mean by that? I think the appeal of what um, this report is pointing to is we normally think of advanced economies growing by growing the pie, pushing out the technology frontier, innovating, the solo paradox, why are we surrounded by the computer? Why is the computer age everywhere except in the productivity data? Um, but the UK, because of the context of inequality, has the potential to catch up by equalizing incomes um, across um, its income distribution and across its regions. And that is, uh, that is doable. Um, you're not looking for um, you know, flying cars. Isn't, isn't that what Back to the Future told us we would have by now? You're looking to increase um, incomes for those people who very much um, you know, need it. And the services economy, it's just worth pointing out, is intangible. It's not as rooted in place as manufacturing. So of course, the report points out, the UK's second biggest services exporter in the world. We've done that despite the fact the global system isn't actually very open to services. I do wonder if that's also part of the Brexit um, issue, which is services liberalization, one of the four freedoms, isn't as open in the EU single market as that term um, suggests. But it, what this does suggest is the UK has real strengths here. And the problem of moving into lower end manufacturing, that is a massive problem. So services value added is about 50% of exports of goods, embodied in the exports of goods. So the serviceification of manufacturing, recognizing that by improving services, which can be across different places, but doesn't mean you exclude manufacturing, I think is also something um, which is worth focusing on to address one of the drivers, mitigate one of the drivers. And there's three areas I'm just going to um, touch on and then, um, and then pause, which is this, this came out very strongly in the report that if you wanted this to be the decisive decade, three different things need to be focused on as solutions, low investment, people, and then place. So quickly on each of these, the UK does have very low private investment relative to the G7, business investment, 10% of GDP versus 13%. So the question is, 
why is business investment so low? There was a recent survey of European firms that said there were two reasons. More than half the firms thought that they're going to have to transform because digitalization is here. But the two reasons were uncertainty and skills. So firms are not investing because of uncertainty. <laughs> so for instance, to give an example, um, if you want more electric vehicles, you need to have charging points. You can't have charging points unless you have planning to put the charging points into the petrol stations. A private car company can put in the charging points if they actually have the regulations, and this is going into Nick's area, to support um, that to support that investment. That's called crowding in. So to me, the questions you know, around how you incentivize private investment, um, how do you make concrete ESG commitments, how do you think about targeting um, those two areas, um, uncertainty and skills seems very important. That brings me to the second point, skills, people. Uh, research by Henry Overman <laughs> um, shows that people is the most important part of making uh, local development work. So in terms of um, participation and mobility, um, I think those are in the report and very much are worth stressing. Um, but I think the issue that I would pull out is um, what you don't want is to move backwards. So um, labor, people, it's not just about their skills. It's actually just about their, mm -hmm. it's about quantity. <laughs> you know, it's growing. Uh, you know, so the fact that we've had 430,000 people um, come out of the labor force, labor force participation rates fall since the pandemic is a massive challenge. In the US, there's a long-standing challenge of declining labor force participation by working age men. So we cannot, if you know this is one of the effects of the pandemic, we need to make sure you're still getting people um, supporting them back into work. And then just finally place. So the leveling up white paper, um, I did a recent event with Andy Haldane, so it's very much front of mind. Um, this, as I've already said, the issue is actually to raise human capital and agency. That's what raises returns to physical and digital investment. You need both, but it is places, you're going to get the sense Manoush is right. All three of these things are actually around people <laughs> and around skills. And that brings me to the challenge. How do you invest in people? This is one of the, this is one of the long-standing um, issues. How do you incentivize private investment? Um, how do you get fiscal devolution to allow places to catch up? How do you prevent drops in the extensive margin with declining labor force participation? I hope these are the things we'll see in the next phase of this report. This is the interim report, because I think policies which look at these very challenging issues um, are very much needed. Um, Dare I say, it's a politically opportune time to have big ideas about policies right now. So I think the timing of this report is actually rather good. So congratulations, David, for um, the Resolution Foundation's role in it, and I'll pause there. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, and you set the challenge for the latter half of the inquiry of coming up with those policy ideas, and I'm sure in the course of today we're going to get some great suggestions. Well, probably the biggest of the changes that we're analyzing in this session is the move to net zero. And we're so lucky to have with us Nick Stern, who is, of course, a professor at the LSE and one of our commissioners. And who better to talk about net zero? Nick, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to, like Linda and, and the earlier panel, to welcome enormously the report. Um, the putting together in such a clear and strong way uh, growth productivity together with uh, income wealth distribution is fundamental and very well done. And then um, Sophie digging into the, um, uh, the causes and understanding some of the uh, underlying features that are driving all this. And then Anna's uh, very thoughtful um, introduction of the net zero. It's, uh, it's, it's all been tremendous. I want to focus on investment and building the sustainable, resilient, and inclusive economy, including, of course, the transition to net zero. But investment is at the heart of that whole transition. Investment is at the heart of productivity, as others have rightly emphasized very well. So the next question, and I'll build on what Linda has said, is how does that happen? What sort of investment? How does it happen? and how does it get financed? The scale and nature of the investment, the policies and institutions 
uh, it, that provide the context and the potential driving forces to translate opportunities into programs, and finally, the finance. So it's these three parts. Now let me begin with the scale and nature of the investment. It's not any old investment. We have a clear program associated with the transition to net zero, associated with building a sustainable, resilient, and inclusive economy, particularly the energy transition and transport. And if you look at those, and this is what we did for the Carbis Bay G7 paper, which we uh, did at the um, request of the then Prime Minister, and it appears also the current Prime Minister, the, um, we came up with numbers around 2 3% of GDP. Others have come, Adair, Turner, Energy Transition Commission, come up with similar kinds of numbers. So we can understand the scale of investment, and we can understand... Um, what sort of investment. And of course, if we get it right, it's a dynamic, cleaner, resource efficient, healthy economy that we get as a result of all these things. Actually, not so long ago, maybe 20 years ago, we were two or three percentage points of GDP higher on investment than now. That's not so hard. And the world macro has planned savings in excess of planned investment. That's why interest rates are on the floor or negative, you know, for obviously not for all borrowers, but for many borrowers. And the answer to that is not to uh, slash planned saving, it is to increase investment. So from the point of view of macro and the past and experience, it's perfectly possible. It's not some way out ask. It's something that we can clearly do. But how does investment happen? And here I want to build on what Linda had to say. I sat every Friday morning for six years in the EBRD on the loan committee looking at the investments, deciding whether we could put the money behind those investments. Not all academics take very big investment uh, decisions. Some do. Keynes took quite a lot. <laughs> but it, this is something where we have to understand how it actually happens, what is looked at, what drives it all. And I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to build on what Linda has to say. In, in the, when I was Chief Economist of the World Bank and EBRD, we looked closely at what we call the investment climate. Let me look at six things within that quickly. The first is clarity on strategy. I, I was a student of the wonderful Bob Solo, and he talked, he said in economics, he's looking after his graduate students, he said, you need faith, hope, and clarity. And the greatest of all these is clarity. <laughs> <laughs> that is fundamental for the whole investment process, as, as Linda just quite rightly Emphasize. It means not flip-flopping all over the place on policies. Um, a very powerful letter from today from Amazon and Unilever, Coca-Cola and, and uh, Lloyds Bank and some others about the importance of being clear and strong on the road to net zero. You really undermine investment if you flip-flop around all over the place. The second thing that people look for is a functioning infrastructure. You've got to be able to move things around and communicate in an efficient way. The third thing that people look at is the ability to get things done and solve problems and actually not be persecuted. I was with a, in a seminar with um, Prime Minister Modi at the end of last week in Delhi, and he expressed it very strongly and clearly in terms of governance, the ability to get things done without being, quotes, interfered with. The, my, close friend and colleague and co-chair of the LSE Growth Commission, Tim Besley, has emphasized the importance of institutions in uh, all this. It's not simply getting the right policy signals, of course it is that, but it's also the institutional structures that uh, allow you to uh, solve your problems. It's the workforce, of course, and uh, I would not want to discriminate too much across these four first things that uh, I've indicated. It's a pleasant place to be and pleasant place to educate your children. So many things are mobile, you know, capital and labor and technology. Why does something happen in a particular place? Lots of good economic geography on all this. Why does it happen in a particular place? Well, part of it is because it's a pleasant place to be on the kinds of dimensions I've just, <coughs> I've just described, including the British Museum and all the other stuff as well. And finally, and deliberately sixth, is tax policy. 
And uh, it's astonishing how much of the investment story being discussed in this very peculiar conversation of the last few, uh, last few days thinks that investment's solely about taxation. It, it matters, but it's down the bottom of, uh, of that uh, list. Finally, in that investment story, and I'll be very brief on net zero, is the uh, finance. I've already indicated that global macro finance looks quite strong. Um, the Glasgow Financial Alliance on Net Zero had now something like $160 trillion of dollars under management uh, declared for Net Zero, roughly half of that uh, whole sector. So it's, but it's all dressed up with nowhere to go. So how do you create somewhere to go? It's through these kinds of uh, six areas that I described which allow you to transform the wonderful investment opportunities into real feasible programs. So that is, is fundamental, but you also have to work hard on risk. So it's not true that those sums of money will go anywhere under any circumstance. It depends on risk. And there's some parts of risk that you can't get rid of. And you've got to have uh, mechanisms for assessing, reducing, sharing, and managing risk. That's why in many places development banking is so important, and for very good reason we instituted the UK Infrastructure Bank. The Decisive decade, and let me say just a few words if, if I've got, what, two minutes left? Mm. Okay. Um, the, this is a decisive decade above all because of climate change. The world's economy will probably create in this next 15 or 20 years at least as much infrastructure as we already have. It'll double in 15 or 20 years, particularly in emerging markets but across the world. If that extra infrastructure looks anything like the one we have, say goodbye to three degrees, let alone well below two degrees. And that matters like anything. We haven't been at three degrees for three million years. Homo sapiens, maybe 300,000. At that time, sea levels are 10 to 20 meters higher than now. Uh, at, even at two some degrees, you'd probably get hundreds of millions of people having to move. And those that didn't move, of course, their lives would be at risk, with a big risk of conflict. Please don't trivialize this. Please don't say we can kick, down, kick the can down the road. Please say, oh, well, net zero 2050. You know. This is the accumulated emissions between now and 2050. This, we are in a real hurry. And if you have new scientific results which counteract that, publish them quickly, and you will be very famous. This is a real hurry. This is the most important sense in which is this is the decisive decade. The UK is a real leader. Will we grow faster as a result of all this? Well, if we kick up investment, that will be a powerful contribution. But there's more than that. The induced technical progress is coming through very fast. We're in a Schumpeterian era, and you're seeing so much of the discovery in these areas. This is all about resource efficiency. Resource efficiency is productivity. Using something twice, three times, four times is productivity. And remember health. We kill this in this country, and it's worse elsewhere, but it's bad enough here. We kill over 30,000 people a year from air pollution. That's not counting the maiming. We just kill about 30,000. One in 2,000 people, roughly. Statistical value of a life, it's a dodgy concept, but I'm just doing orders of magnitude, often 100 times GDP per capita, roughly varies across the country. 100 times 1 over 2,000 is 1 over 20. That alone is 5% of GDP. It's huge, and that's not counting the maiming. Now, you can fiddle around with those numbers, but whichever way you look at it, it's big, and it matters enormously to productivity, GDP, and so on. But in order to get these great results, have a much cleaner, healthier, safer you know, economy, you have to invest. It doesn't come just by itself, and you have to create the things. I'm not going to say much about distribution. I haven't got the time, but please don't interpret that as my thinking it's not important. It's hugely important, and there'll be lots to do in, about distribution in the transition, whole, the whole transition story. Um, it, finally, global leadership. Uh, with comparative advantage, I won't rehearse again. Gregory uh, handled that, I thought, very clearly. But this is a world which is fractious and difficult. And I spend a lot of time in places and on subjects where it's fractious and difficult. If you can get together around development, sustainable development, and climate, you're getting people together around a subject where there's some chance of getting people together. And if they collaborate on some things, 
on Willie on one or two very important things, the probability of them getting together on others goes up. It may not leap up, but it uh, goes up. Our leadership on development and climate has been strong. There's danger that it could be undermined. That would be very damaging for us and for the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Let's stick with net zero for a moment. And, and that challenge that you referred to of the, on the distributional side, uh, we've had an interesting question where, about the politics of net zero being more contested and what effect this might have on the speed of the transition. And of course, in our report, in the interim report, we, we draw attention to the fact that we're talking about 1.4 trillion of investment, but there's going to be 1.1 trillion of savings. But meanwhile, there is quite a significant upfront investment cost, and we worry that that means lower consumption in an environment of low growth, and who's going to bear those adjustment costs. So yeah, why don't you talk a little bit more about that, Nick? Yeah. Um, the, the, most of the investment should be in the private sector. There's significant public sector, um, you know, public transport, grids and things, but the, most of it will be in the uh, private sector. Long-term capital is absolutely available for sound long-term investments. Borrowing, particularly private sector borrowing, around those activities is very important. That's why it's so important to get the whole investment climate right so that that private long-term borrowing can take place. I also think that there's a real growth story there, and I hope that in the next round we'll dig deeper into uh, that uh, growth story. So um, in, in a narrow fixed GDP, more investment means less consumption. And some of that will be there. But I think long-term borrowing for sound long-term projects makes an enormous amount of sense. And you know, talk to Nigel Wilson, who has to run legal in general and take very long-term investment decisions. Now talk to Larry, Larry Fink, who runs BlackRock. They say this is the big investment opportunity of the 21st century, and they're ready to put long-term capital behind it. Of course, you've got to create good long-term prospects, and that's where policies and institutions are so important. There's a, there's a distributional side, which is very important, around the fact that the cost of capital for poorer people mm. is a lot higher mm. than for richer people. And that's why uh, the, the report, quite rightly, says we have to dig deeper into the whole story of making our homes much more efficient, particularly in the content and, and switching from you know, uh, gas boilers to heat pumps, particularly because the cost of capital is high for poorer people. That's a real distributional challenge. Similarly, you know, I, I, I can park my electric vehicle in the drive because I have a drive and I've got a charger in my drive. Well, not everybody has a drive, right? I've noticed that. And <laughs> if, you are in a, if you are in a poor part of London or Manchester or wherever, you know, Newcastle, wherever it might be, you know, having the means to charge your electric vehicle. Most electric, you know, obviously you, many people buy electric vehicles new. Most poorer people don't buy new cars. You know, there's a very important distributional aspects uh, of all that in the transition, which we have to take te head on in public policy. I, I, let's hear Linda on this as well, because there's a sort of crucial issue here emerging from the report, which is that there's it, the report on these three changes, and of course they're very different, and the net zero is the most important challenge of the lot, is a, is a bit subdued about, certainly in the 2020s, to what extent there's a large-scale growth opportunity for net zero. It's clearly something that's got to be done. But the effects on the labour market and such like, the interim report is actually quite subdued about those. And I don't know if mm -hmm. Linda, and we'll then turn to Sophie now, do you want to comment on that? Can we, should we be a bit more optimistic and see it as more of a growth opportunity? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'd like to think so. Um, I think my... <laughs> My worry about it is, um, I guess like Nick, I go to a lot of global business, public, various forums, and there's always a lot of, you know, um, yes, yes, yes. And then you have to go and look at what's been, what's been done, what the funding that's been allocated. And there just does seem to be a number of things which um, 
you know, I want to believe we're on the cusp because I do think there is a massive um, uh, opportunity um, for not just growth, but a proving quality of life, so long as we're careful about the impact of this kind of technological change on people and wages, which comes out very strongly in the report. Um, but the transition will be costly. It requires funding and changing the way businesses and people uh, work and live. But there's no reason why um, we can't have an efficient, much better economy and society running using green sources of energy um, this is a bit of history and then I'll pause. Renewables were doing really well in the late Victorian period. <laughs> um, however, the discovery of oil changed all of that um, in the early 20th century. So there's no reason why we, so long as we're willing to, to invest, bear the costs and address the, the impact, why we can't come out the other side um, you know, in, a better, in a better society and world and you know, learn the lesson of a century ago. Don't go with the cheapest source of energy which I think we have, but it's that motivating the actual investment. I think that's going to be, you know, so Nick's points are really well made. And, you know, by the way, I don't want to be cynical about big public gatherings because that's actually how you create social change, right? It's called the tipping point. Enough times when people see there's a consensus, it does move, it does shift. So even though we can all be skeptical, go along to these big public forums, continue to push, and then we could have a tipping point, in which case it really does change. And I do hope that is the case. So anyways, that's why we continue to go to these things, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. So we missed out on electric cars 100 years ago. We're not going to make yeah. the same mistake again. <laughs> um, just before I, I uh, move on, let me just bring up the poll question for people on Slido, including people in this room on Slido, which is asking uh, you to assess uh, the crucial, the relative significance of the different trends. And in a moment, I'm going to ask our panelists to comment on those trends and particularly press them on the something that hasn't happened yet. And be interesting to know if there are other big trends and changes that they expect in the 2020s that we've not yet covered. But first of all, Anna, I mean, this issue of how big, and you've done so much work on this, the economic effect of the net zero transition in the 2020s, what's your assessment of the opportunity? Well, generally, I like to be optimistic about this because my personal view is if we're not optimistic, that lessens the chances of having any positive impacts. Um, and as Linda said, we need to create that optimism to actually inspire businesses and people to make changes. But of course, we have to be realistic. Um, so a lot of investments in innovation and other long-term things, whether it's skills or infrastructure, can take a while to actually be fully deployed and therefore realizing benefits. But having said that, there are many areas of technology where we know what we need to do and the solutions exist and we need to improve the deployment across the economy. And many of those things are consistent also with more productive processes. So even beyond resource efficiency, although very interacting with that, is, is this intersection between digital technologies and smart systems and net zero. Um, and actually, a similar analysis that we did on revealed technological advantage, when we, when we took the technologies that are kind of registered as being both digital and relevant for net zero, we're even more specialized in that. And you might expect that because we know we have a lot of kind of digital um, innovation going on in our country. So I think there are existing innovative companies that um, could be helped to grow. You know, we know that we're not so good at scale up in the UK. So there are existing growth opportunities for those inventing the technologies. There are existing deployment opportunities for the solutions where we know already what we need to do, but we're just not doing enough of it. I would say, however, you can be optimistic that it's possible, but we're clearly in a continued uncertain environment and perhaps now more policy uncertainty given potentially change in a prime minister and we're unsure where, where the kind of um, commitment's going to be. Um, and we also know that there are skills bottlenecks. So even when things um, are, you know, when there are efforts to do things, sometimes we just don't have the skills in place to actually do it, um, and many other things as well in the broader environment, which is why I really emphasize that net zero in itself isn't going to solve our problems, but embedding it in, in an actual growth strategy um, has high chances of doing so. Yeah, and I asked a senior Treasury official after Rishi's massive package why it was almost entirely for the costs and helping on the income effect, and nothing really about investing in home insulation programs as a long-term solution. And her explanation was, we weren't confident we got the skills people to install the stuff, so we, we could not believe that the money would necessarily 
the spent, which brings out one of the themes in our inquiry, that these different challenges hang together and the skills challenge is so important. Sophie, I mean, there is a slight flavour in this chapter that none of these three changes are necessarily in the 2020s going to have quite as big an impact as some people claimed. Is that a fair summary? Um, I mean, I think, I think that is fair, particularly in terms of the job losses that some people have been expecting. So we're not seeing a brand new, completely different version of the UK. And I think that's really important when you're thinking about what your economic strategy needs to be. Um, it needs to be set for the economy as it looks now and not for some kind of mythical economy that you're expecting to be. So a kind of version of Germany or something that, that you might be hoping to be. But it has meant that we have a lot of uncertainty. We have, you know, uncertainty being created by Brexit and from, from, from a number of these shocks. And we're talking about how important investment is um, in kind of delivering net zero and in kind of driving productivity for the economy. And we know that kind of broad economic uncertainty in the economy is, is, is really damaging for investment. And, and kind of Nick Sturden has kind of covered that already, you know, that um, businesses need certainty, they need predictability, and they need a clarity of a strategy so that they can, can make long-term investment decisions. Good. Thanks very much. Now, a question from our audience here. Anybody here wants you to put a question to our panel? There's a person there, yes? Yeah, well, I, I guess it's a question, but perhaps it's a bit of a statement with a bit of bias loaded in there. But, but on well, at that least list... you're it in advance. No, well, I, and I wanted to. But on that list there, you list all those things. I'm not sure that's the biggest thing worrying me. What? The biggest thing worrying me is the capability and competence of the government and the machinery of the state to reorientate itself so that we can deliver the very obvious opportunities that are out there. And uh, perhaps, um, and, and I don't really know too much about this, but the headline for me, I was astounded when I heard, I think last autumn, when Richie Sunak said, we spend the same amount on education today as we did 10 or 14 years ago. And um, I'm not saying money is the answer to everything. So maybe you would like to comment on that, or maybe you'd just like to say thank you very much. <laughs> we, well, i tell you what we'll do. I, we will comment on it. But what we'll do is we'll call up, first of all, the answers to the poll question. Uh, let us see how the votes have gone. And then I'm going to ask our panellists... Uh, to comment on the results, and uh, yes, net zero, net zero wins, uh, and COVID it seems fascinating. COVID, how rapidly it's disappearing as a preoccupation. Um, so let's, and let's also just, uh, this will be, I think, our final comment from the panelists as we're beginning to run out of time. What about the something that hasn't happened yet? Let's, as well as the classic uh, issues that we have identified, tell us if there is something that we should have thought of and haven't. Uh, Anna, let's start with you. Well, I mean, we have thought about it in the inquiry. It's just not on this list. But I think technological change, because those who are, say, technolo technological optimists consider that many of this current wave of digital technologies are not yet fully embedded. And we, you know, as Greg said, we're not yet fully seeing the impacts on the economy, on society, on productivity. So it might be that as various complementary factors are in place, um, those technologies are deployed more widely and that could have impacts on work. Um, you know, it's hard to look into the future though and, and actually predict exactly how that would happen. But I would say that actually those technologies do interact quite a lot with net zero as well. So yeah. one example is AI technologies being used to optimize factories and something called digital twin or power plants. So there's a lot of potential there. Many, many of these ideas are being developed. They're not fully deployed yet. Anna and I are technophiles, and it's a very important body of opinion. And I hope to find some more allies today. Uh, Sophie. Um, yeah, so I mean, I probably would have agreed with the crowd that net zero is the biggest one. Uh, in terms of the something that hasn't happened yet, I mean, it, it has already kind of happened. So, or at least it started to happen. So, you know, Brexit was not the only... Um, sort of event that was going in the face of kind of the globalization that we've seen of decades. You know, at the same time, we had a sort of trade war emerging between um, the US and China. Um, and I think that kind of geopolitical context, um, we don't, I mean, a little bit with the kind of war in Ukraine, but we're not talking about it a lot. 
um, and you know the kind of breakdown of, of, of unilateral activity and countries being able to kind of work together and we saw elements of that during the COVID pandemic with kind of export restrictions and, and other activity and um, we've seen bits of it um, uh, as I said, with, with new trade barriers kind of being implemented. Um, and that could be something that we see, you know, trending into this decade, um, countries sort of becoming a bit more um, domestically focused, less internationally focused, supply chains changing. Um, yeah, just a kind of disruption to the kind of global system as we know it. Yeah, and, and, and let's pick up on that comment as I turn to, to Linda and then Nick, that, that comment. And you could argue that indeed the, the un unspecified trend is a continuing decline in the capacity of the political systems in major democratic countries to tackle these challenges. Um, and of course, America is the most vivid example of a blocked system where change has got harder and harder, certainly at the federal level. Um, but things can get worse across Europe as well. And we are kind of assuming that government carries on in, and, and functions, maybe we are seeing long-term trends which make it harder and harder to in a diverse country with uh, in a vicious spiral of high inequality and no growth, actually to command a majority to get anything serious done. So maybe that is our extra challenge. But Linda, what do you, what do you think? How would you assess that? I, I'm going to pick technology, <laughs> much as tempting as that was, David, <laughs> to go uh, into the politics. I mean, I think the, um, so one of the lessons from history is uh, it's actually really hard to use technology. So I'll just give you an example. Uh, I mentioned the solo paradox earlier. So, you know, Zoom IPO'd in 2019, um, you know, but the technology adoption of Zoom, um, that's the change. The tech was there. It only, Zoom only works if your clients and your colleagues are willing to do Zoom. And that's an example of why productivity rose in the, less in the last tech boom in the uh, late 1990s. TFP rose across the economy because people changed the way in which they work. That's what um, means to embody, embed the technology. So I think because of the pandemic, we have now embedded different ways of working. You've seen wholesale change. To me, that's the key factor, which is going to help with the net zero. It's going to help because it is an embrace. It's, it's so obvious, but, but we just don't do it, right? That's why I gave mm -hmm. the Zoom example. Um, we could have done it in 2019, but we don't. There's a lot of inertia in, in work and life. Um, and I think that's where I think there's something else could be very transformative for the UK economy. And yes, it will impact the green transition. It will impact um, our trade position after Brexit. It will impact our ability to, to deal with pandemics because a lot of those have been enabled in different ways by um, technological breakthroughs, but not just the mm. breakthroughs. It's not the macro inventions that really matter. It's actually the micro steps. And I think that's where um, I think we could have a known unknown um, it's not an unknown unknown, it's a known unknown, but mm. it's not a known known, you know, so it's a known unknown. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we'll settle for known unknown. Uh, Nick. Yeah, um, I think solving the problems of the kind that um, were just raised in, in uh, our audience here really is much easier if you've got growth. Yeah. And Minouche made that point. And remember, of course, that you don't get to net zero by zero consumption. You get to net zero by breaking the relationship between consumption and production as we have it and the environment more generally on the other. And you do that through investment and that investment gives you some growth. So we must avoid, I, I, I worked in the, in, in, in the Treasury, I was head of the Government Economic Service, Chief Economist of the World Bank, I've taught public finance for 50 years. I think I understand fiscal responsibility, but I think I also understand the difference between fiscal responsibility and premature austerity. Yeah. And premature austerity is not fiscal responsibility. It kills growth, and it did kill growth in the last decade in the uh, UK. Not the only part of the story, but part of it. On the kind of change, now I'm going to turn optimistic now. Um, in my lifetime, which is longer than most of you here, um, we've seen the UK transformed after the Second World War. I worked at the EBRD, and, and this was about transfer, transforming helping to support the transformation of the economies of Eastern Europe and so on. If you compare Poland at the beginning of the 1990s and Poland now, it is an extraordinary 
transformation. Lots of bits there that don't look so pretty, but at the same time, you've got an enormous transformation of the economy. I worked in India in the 1990s as well, and that economy was transformed in 10 years or so. Very different examples, but you can get things going reasonably quickly with the right kind of purposefulness, but you know, being, being purposeful um, and not necessarily imperfect, and all the examples I've given were not perfect uh, environments. On technology, we're actually lucky that the AI digital story has come with the climate story because so much of this is about managing big, complicated systems, energy, transport, cities, land, and so on. And in the village I've been working on in UP, in a very poor village in a very poor state of India, the mobile phone, has, the smartphone, has transformed people's ability to understand where informal sector uh, jobs are in nearby towns. It's helped understand when you should plant, what you should, uh, use, what planting techniques you should use, and so on. So right from the managing the big cities and helping them be friendly towards cyclists and pedestrians and public transport, <laughs> all the way down, the technology has been enormously important. We're lucky here. Finally, what I fear, stumbling into a war with China or Russia, you know, that is a risk, and incompetence magnifies that risk and we don't know what the next pandemic will look like. There will be one, and it may not be very pretty. Those of you who want to look at these things, read the wonderful Lucy Shapiro, a Stanford uh, biologist. Well, thank you very much, and uh, those are some really important challenges to add to the list. Thank you to our excellent panel. Thank you for ending on that note of the, of the technological opportunities, and I think there, we probably do understate, if we get it right, how rapidly it can change things for the better. It's very smart software and really advanced sensors that transform the efficiency performance of turbine blades so that you get much greater performance from your offshore wind. And we haven't had time today to talk about the biological revolution, which I think may be as significant in the next 20 years as the AI digital revolution. Uh, but now we'll break for coffee and resume at half past 11. Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>